Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to a special edition of Coronavirus Facts First. I'm Adam Chodak. And I'm Atia Collins. Now, the city of Rochester has been taking steps to try and combat the health disparities in our community and work for racial equity. But the pandemic has left many in Rochester with questions and concerns about the vaccine and about resources available. That's right. So tonight we're joined by a panel of local experts to answer your questions on these topics and more. For our first segment, we're pleased to welcome from the community right now, the founding director of the Frederick Douglass Center for Collaborative Leadership, Dr. Hank Rubin, and the deputy commissioner for the Monroe County Department of Health, Dr. Mary Elena Velez de Brown, to talk about Rochester's real rapid response team. Thank you both for being here this evening. Dr. Rubin, I want to start with you and let's get the basics out of the way. For those who don't know, what is the RRRT? The um, Real Rapid Response Team is a, an outgrowth of the uh, City of Rochester and County of Monroe Partnership for Racial Equity and Leadership that began about two years ago um, in recognition of the fact that the disparities associated with the um, impact of, of COVID um, runs right down racial lines and other lines of disparities in Rochester in the Monroe County area. So Rio put together the rapid response team made up of a range of organizations and resources across the region that are working together to make sure that those disparities are recognized, measured, addressed, remedied as best as possible. Next question is for Dr. Velez De Brown. Excuse me, Velez De Brown. Dr. De Brown, how has the program helped in the coronavirus pandemic? Well, this program has been instrumental in helping us to address those disparities that Dr. Rubin mentioned. Um, we do have some data that does explain the fact that this equity work is important because we've analyzed the numbers having to do with the cases of COVID in our county, and the data do show significant disparities. When we look at a comparison of the rates of COVID cases, um, in our county, we do see that African American, Latino populations have carry a disproportionately high burden in terms of cases, um, even though our county population is 70% white. Um, and that disparity carries through to hospitalizations, where um, African Americans have four times higher rate of uh, hospitalization due to COVID compared when we compare the data across racial and ethnic lines. And even when we look at death data, um, still, African Americans, Hispanics have a disproportionately high percentage and, and proportion of the folks who end up dying of COVID-19. Uh, so this work is helping us to get information out to communities that are hard to reach at times. This is helping us distribute protective measures such as masks. And now it's critical uh, to distribute vaccines so that we can protect all of our community members, but especially those that have been hardest hit by this epidemic. And we're going to get to more on this in a moment. But Dr. Velez de Brown, I want to stay with you for just a moment. For those listening and thinking to themselves, you know, I haven't gotten the vaccine yet. What resources are out there for them so they can get it tomorrow, next week, as quickly as possible? Yeah, so there are a number of different locations where we are bringing vaccine out into the community. Um, there's certainly a numerous agencies that have received vaccination in people's backyards, so sometimes in their pharmacies. The county certainly has uh, the Rochester Riverside Convention Center, which is ready and able uh, to accept many more uh, patients than we're currently seeing at the moment. Um, but there are also a number of different churches in the four quadrants of the city of Rochester, where we have a schedule already prearranged of when our teams are working together to bring the vaccine out into the community so that we can overcome barriers of transportation and other barriers that keep folks from getting their vaccine. Very good. This next question is for Dr. Hank Rubin. Dr. Rubin, your work with the Frederick Douglass Initiative has allowed you to really take a macro view of our community. And I've heard from several medical experts that this pandemic has shed a light on the disparities within the healthcare system. But I'd like to ask you for your take, some of the observations that you've had over the last year. The disparities play out in all sorts of ways. We are. Um, we face disparities in access to uh, resources, uh, healthcare resources. We uh, face disparities in um, um, access to information. 
We face disparities in um, an understanding and an appreciation um, for, the, um, um, uh, for, for the complexity of the disease. Um, and and uh, in, in total, um, it's not just the disparities that we face in how the, um, how the disease impacts us as collections of individuals. It's how the disease impacts us in the social context of who we are as individuals. Um, people of color tend to be, um, in the, uh, uh, in the history of Rochester, people who comprise more blue collar and service industries. Those blue collar and service jobs tend not to be works that work that can be done at home. They tend to be work that, uh, irrespective of, of, of the pandemic, uh, need to be done on a face-to-face -face basis. Um, uh, people who um, are of lower income, and in Rochester, we almost have a one-to-one -one correlation between income and race. People who are of a lower income uh, tend uh, not to be able to afford the necessary home supports that can uh, be there when children are home from school. And it creates all sorts of complexities in regards to the capacity to support the family. Um, people of color tend to be losing jobs. People of color tend to be uh, more financially impacted. People of color tend to have um, a reflection on the history of vaccinations in American uh, uh, history, uh, wherein we're, we're, we're trepidatious about, we're not sure that we can trust uh, vaccinations. Uh, and these are all elements of education and elements of communication that need to be uh, undertaken and we've been working to undertake across all color lines. Now going along right with that, that trust and that across color lines, Dr. Velez Day Brown, you mentioned that hospital rates are up in communities of color and also death rates are up in communities of color. What do you think needs to be done in order to reach these communities in order to get them the information they need about the vaccine? Yeah, so we know from other areas of health, other um, disparities that we see in all kinds of disease states um, that critical important information that is reliable needs to be transmitted to communities from a trusted source. It needs to be explained in terms that people can understand and it needs to be presented in lots of different ways and multiple times so that folks can really have a chance to have their questions answered, uh, think about why is it so important for me to get vaccinated? Why is it so important for me to continue to wear my mask and wash my hands and go get tested for COVID-19? Um, those messages need to be repeated frequently so that folks can continue to do the work that we all need to do in order to address this pandemic. This is not the time for people to get um, a little bit comfortable, a little bit lazy about wearing those masks and um, engaging in that social distancing. Um, doing, engaging in all of these behaviors is really what we need to do in order to get to the point where we can overcome this pandemic and getting information about the fact that these vaccines are safe, that they're effective, that they work in communities of color, that communities of color were included as vaccine trial volunteers. So we know that these vaccines are effective and they can protect folks from getting sick from COVID, from being hospitalized or from dying from COVID. All of those messages need to be broadly disseminated through um, TV and radio and also from folks that people trust, whether it's their pastor, whether it's a neighbor that's already been vaccinated, whether it's family members who have lost a loved one to COVID. We really need to exploit all of these modalities so that we can get folks the information that they need. Okay, Dr. Velesday Brown, thank you. Community engagement and spreading information seems to be the key points. Coming up, we'll have more of our community conversation on race and equity in Rochester when we come back. Good. All right.
and Lee. It's Lyman. Lyman, I'm sorry. Yes, I was just too caught. Did I get that right? It's Lyman Torres. Um, I'm the Commissioner of Recreation and Human Services. Great job. I mean, I thought she was an actress. I, she, she was spot on. She was substantial. I'm up here with the talent. This is the true talent. Yeah. Welcome back everyone to our community conversation on race equity in Rochester. For our next segment, we are joined by other members of the community leaders in our community. Some of them you might recognize. First, the city of Rochester's uh, chief equity officer. We have Dr. Cephas Archie. Dr. Archie, thank you for joining us. And of course, we've already introduced you to Dr. Velez de Brown. Joining us right now to your right is the Commissioner of the Department of Recreation and Human Services for the City of Rochester, Dr. Danielle Lyman Torres. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Now, Dr. Archie, I want to start with you, and we're talking about the Real Rapid Response Team. Tell me, what was the purpose behind this team, and how did it get started? Well, first off, we we'll appreciate the opportunity to be here with you this evening. I, I want to say that the work was developed out of a genuine approach that we saw the disparities amongst our community that were also mirrored throughout the nation. Data as highlighted by Dr. Velez de Brown demonstrated that amongst our hospitalization, amongst our infection, and unfortunately our mortality rates, the African American and Latinx communities were most disparately impacted. And so we developed a, pro a process and an organization that really looked at collaboratively coming together to build off of a model such as collaborative leadership, individual ownership, and what that meant is that as independent organizations, whether they are governmental or healthcare based or community related, independently, our individual resources, our personnel, our funding would be limited when it came to the overall impact that we collectively could make as a united front. And so bringing together organizations such as University of Rochester's Medical Center, Rochester Regional, Common Ground, Trillium, Jordan Health, RCSD, RTS, Community Fighting COVID, the Black Physicians Network, the Black Nurses Association, the Frederick Douglass Initiative Project. We wanted to be very deliberate by saying collaboratively, we wish to be more impactful and more effective being deliberate in addressing the deficits that we saw specifically amongst our communities of color. With that very same tenacity, with that very same focus, for the last year, we have demonstrated our ability to bring together opportunities that are directly targeting these populations. And so to do it in a comprehensive manner, not just looking at our health care, not just looking at our processes and our resources and programs in place for funding connected to housing and grants related to education, but to truly look at the full spectrum of needs that are identified by our community and develop local solutions to the national identified challenges which we've seen. 
Dr. Archie, thank you so much. We'll be coming back to you momentarily, but first we're gonna move over to Dr. Lyman Torres. Dr. Torres, many of the facilities in Rochester are being used now to help with the vaccination effort along with the testing effort. A lot is being asked of your staff. First, before we get to any specifics, how is your team doing trying to handle all of this? Well, our team is, you know, has been on the front lines of supporting the community throughout the pandemic response. Um, our team has been out handing out food um, since the since day one, um, supporting families and children with remote learning. Um, so our, our and handing out PPE as we've needed it um, at the community base level. So our team is really um, you know, they're excited about being a part of this because they've been serving the community throughout the pandemic and they want to be a part of the solution. Um, they love to serve the community and they know um, the neighbors who are coming to this to the vaccine sites that we're running. Absolutely. And Dr. Lyman Torres, one quick follow up for you. Why don't we get very specific right away? There are people out there who ask, how much does this cost? Where can I go to sign up? These questions are out there. What's the answer? Well, people need to know that they don't have to pay anything to, to get the vaccine. The vaccine is already taxpayer funded, so people may be asked to bring their insurance card. Um, and if they do have insurance, the insurance companies will be billed for um, some administrative charges. But if you don't have an insurance card, you can still get the vaccine. You don't need to have one. Um, it is free to you. So we do want people to to know that and to be encouraged to, to come and get the vaccine, not being worried that there's going to be a cost associated with it. Dr. Lyman Torres, thank you so much. I now want to go over to Dr. Velez Day Brown. We've been talking a lot about the vaccine, about what the community get, needs and how we can get the vaccine into places that need it most. But let's take a step back and talk about the COVID numbers. Where are we right now with COVID-19 and who is getting the virus at this moment? Yes, that's an important question. If I can just add on to the previous question about the fact that everyone who works or lives in the state of New York, who is at least 16 years of age, is eligible to get the vaccine. So your immigration status doesn't matter. None of your information is shared with ICE or with um, immigration services. Uh, whether you are employed doesn't matter. Whether you have insurance or not, everyone who's over the age of 16 now qualifies and, and is eligible to get the vaccine. Um, now, in terms of who is getting COVID-19 now, um, our seniors who were at the highest risk of dying of COVID-19 were the first priority to receive the vaccine. And so we've actually done a really good job of protect protecting our elders. So now the numbers are shifting um, to folks who are between the ages of 18 and 29. Those are the folks that are contributing the highest number of cases, the biggest proportion of cases now. Um, we're finding that we are still seeing disproportionate case numbers amongst people of color for all of the reasons that Dr. Archie and, and Dr. Rubin have shared. Um, some of our hospital numbers are starting to increase again um, with the advent of some of these new variants that we're seeing in the United States. Those numbers are still going up. So now is not the time to relax. We all need to continue to work together and protect ourselves and our families and our communities, not just by getting the COVID vaccine, um, but uh, also continuing to wash your hands and socially distance. Um, and unfortunately, some of the numbers as you're seeing on your screen right now for even the folks between ages of 30 and 44 are starting to go up as well. Dr. Right. Excuse me, Adam, Dr. Velez Dave Brown. Great, great numbers, great information. Yes, like you said, the COVID virus is still here in our community yeah. and it's still a serious problem, Adam. Absolutely. Dr. Archie is going to weigh in here. Dr. Archie, again, if you missed it, he is helping to run this real rapid response team in the city of Rochester. What is your take on what you just heard from Dr. Velez de Brown. So uh, I, I am so grateful for the partnership that we have been able to establish uh, amongst these community organizations stated. And this is why it's so critical that we have such communication resources and opportunities such as this to get information out. Dr. Velez de Brown is emphatically correct and we wish to support all of the vaccination efforts that are being provided in partnership with the county as well as throughout our, our faith communities and churches, etc. as mentioned. I also could not let this opportunity pass to recognize that as certain communities, there may be some uh, delay in our decision to get the vaccine. And so this is why it is also equally as important when we talk about the vaccination to also reiterate the value of testing. 
that it be continually addressed, that we develop regularly scheduled testing plans that allow us to decide where and in what community we will be getting our testing efforts. If there is a sp respective position on delaying our decision to get the vaccine or that timeline, we, are, we absolutely respect that as it is a personal choice and is a decision. It is recommended, but we respect the people's opinion. But I want to make sure that it is clear that if we are not getting the vaccination, we are strongly encouraged encouraging you to stay tested, stay protecting your family by keeping aware of your status to make sure that the infection rates continue to decline. As just stated by my colleague, there is a small uptick in these numbers as of late. Dr. Archie, great point. Still get tested for coronavirus if you're not going to get the vaccine and stay diligent in your efforts. Coming up after the break, we'll have more on our community conversation on equity. Welcome back to the special edition of Coronavirus Facts First. We are talking about the healthcare disparities within communities of color in our area, especially when it comes to vaccinations. We're just seeing a lower rate right now. You heard Dr. Archie just a few minutes ago talk about a hesitancy in the community. There's also the issue of access, which the Black Agenda Group has been very vocal about in our area. I'd like to circle in Dr. Lyman Torres right now to address this when it comes to hesitancy and access. What are your thoughts, Dr. Lyman Torres? I think, you know, what's already been brought up is the, the concept of trust, um, that people, you know, have to build trust um, to, to ask questions and to talk about their hesitations. And you do that with people that you know, uh, primarily. So what we've been trying to focus on is making sure that we have people who are familiar, um, that, that our community members can, can ask questions, people they already trust. 
um, that they can ask questions and learn more about it. And so that's one of the reasons why we've really been focused on uh, partnering with community-based organizations, organizations that are already in neighborhoods, uh, that people already receive services and supports from. They know them, they trust them. Uh, that's where they can ask their questions. And what we've been trying to do is also make it a place where people can get the vaccine uh, because they already have that trust built and that relationship built. So, you know, with that said, you know, we can do a lot to build that trust. Um, by building relationships, but it's it's really important to keep um, language access as a, as a for, at the forefront, and that is why we've really wanted to keep faces familiar, have familiar faces at neighborhood-based sites where people can feel comfortable asking questions, saying, "Hey, did you get the vaccine? Um, if you did, how was it?" Um, so that that word of mouth. Um, that people really rely on from their friends, their family, their neighbors, their church uh, members. That's, that's critical to, to getting people to understand and be comfortable with asking questions. And asking questions, of course, very important to getting any information. A lot of questions have been brought up lately about the J&J &J vaccine. And we're going to go to Dr. Velez Day Brown next. I want to talk about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, about some of the concerns we're seeing, and about the pause that recently happened, and how that's impacting the community here. Yes, um, so it's an important point to understand. Um, in terms of the pause, um, it's, I actually see this as a good thing. I see the fact that the safety and monitoring systems that the Food and Drug Administration and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have instituted, they're working. And so we see that when the medical experts at the CDC, at the FDA noted that there were some cases of this rare uh, clot in the brain, they decided to take the most protective action. They stopped the use of these vaccines while they continue to collect information about these cases, uh, look for any further reports of whether this is happening so that their medical experts and their vaccine uh, scientists and researchers can do the analysis that's needed so that we can determine, is it safe in specific populations? Is there even an association between receiving this vaccine and having this blood clot occur? Uh, because I think it's important for folks to realize folks have been having these cerebral venous sinus uh, clots even before the vaccine was invented. So this situation was occurring at some baseline rate and so now they're taking the time that's needed. Um, they're prioritizing the safety of the American people to do the analysis that's needed to determine is it safe in just specific populations or, you know, this is just a rare event that happened to occur within some timeline, but it's not really causally related. And so I am actually increased in my confidence because we're seeing that these safety and monitoring systems are working. And it's also important to just remember that there were six cases of these blood clots that happened among 7.2 million doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So that's less than a one in a million chance. You have a higher likelihood of getting struck by lightning than of taking this vaccine and having this very bad outcome happen. Um, and it's also really important for the community to be aware if you catch COVID, that also increases your risk of developing blood clots in your lungs and other parts of your body. So, um, you know, I, folks need to really consider that it's more dangerous to remain unprotected from COVID than to actually take the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. But this pause, I think, is wise. Um, it was the most protective action, and we are now waiting for the medical experts to look at all the data and come to a conclusion and give some guidance about when it will be safe to use and in whom. Very good. Dr. Velez Day Brown, thank you. We're going to get to Dr. Archie in a moment. We're going to take a short break, but when we come back to him, we're going to talk about what the real rapid response team is doing to make sure that there is access in the coming weeks and months. And we know that's so important as we try to reach herd immunity before we see more variants in the area. So his work and his team's work, exceptionally important, and we're going to ask him about that in just a moment. Stay with us.
Welcome back to our town hall. Yes, we are calling this, as you see here, a community conversation on race equity. But when it comes to vaccinations and getting to herd immunity, it's about our entire community. We are trying to get to a certain percentage. And so we want everybody as informed as possible and to get vaccinated so we can reach that herd immunity. And the rapid, the real rapid response team is trying to home in on certain communities in our area and leading the charge on that is Dr. Cephas Archie. Dr. Archie, why don't you talk about the steps that are being taken right now to make sure that there is access, there is information coming from your team. Thank you. I think it's important to, uh, to really understand the structure of the real rapid response team. We're broken down into three respective groups. One is our testing and treatment team who oversees and partners with our other city of Rochester and Monroe County structures such as the hub to make sure that we are a part of that larger work, getting these vaccinations and testing efforts into the community. That group is led by Dr. Robert Mayo as well as Dr. Linda Clark. Um, as a part of their work, they have been working alongside with the hub and they're doing great efforts. The second group is the education and prevention team, which is led by, as you met a moment ago, Dr. Hank Rubin and myself. And our role is specifically to help get the information out, to support the communication avenues, the platforms, to make sure that these specific communities of color are aware of the efforts of our testing and treatment team, but as well as the support services and resources team that all work collaboratively to get these things done. The Support Services and Resources team is currently led by Tina Foster and Commissioner Wright, uh, Thalia Wright of uh, Monroe County. These teams work interchangeably to make sure that we are meeting regularly collectively to make sure that our efforts are not developed in a silo. What we have learned is that when we work in silos is when the people who need our resources most are most in harm. And so with our efforts today, it's not only for us to communicate what we are doing specifically for the communities of color, but even more deliberately for those communities or those personnel or those leaders who are in place who may not be, who engage with communities of color, who are our, our partners in communicating these resources, the vaccination efforts, the testing efforts. And so every principal, every superintendent, every healthcare professional, every business owner who works alongside and or supports these communities of color, this program today is vital for you to serve as the conduit for getting this information into the hands and the ears of people who need it most. And we're going to look specifically about how these resources are helping those communities that need it most, starting with Dr. Lyman Torres. You talked earlier about where resources are out there in the community, but I want to ask specifically, what does this access look like? What are some of the set steps you are taking to reach communities of color, to reach non-English speaking, speaking communities, and to just reach those that need it most? I think that it's important to remember that, you know, as we started the vaccination process, the supply was very low and that low supply really amplified the disparities, amplified the inequities in terms of access to the vaccine. And that comes in, in, into play when you talk about how you even get an appointment. So when vaccines are only available by appointment and especially when the supply was low, um, getting those appointments was, was primarily online, although there were uh, hotlines that people could call as well. And with that digital divide in place, the, you know, the, the divide around technology and internet access, um, and especially when we started out with older adults and the familiarity with the websites and using those websites to create um, appointments, that became a huge barrier. So we came together as a community and partnered with community-based organizations, organizations that serve older adults uh, as we started, such as Lifespan and others, uh, who could say, we can help facilitate enrollment for these vaccine appointments. And so we focused heavily on facilitated enrollment, creating a way for people just to pick up a phone, make a simple phone call to a number that they were familiar with and get assistance with making an appointment. We helped people with transportation, um, schedule the transportation that is available in the community, uh, partnered with RTS, partnered with Medical Motors and other providers who could help get people to the sites when they needed it most. And this was the equity issue. Uh, working with uh, the state and the county and talking with uh, them about where to put the FEMA site, where to put the site that is now there at the Hawkeye location, the former Hawkeye location, that was centrally located there in a zip code that still remains, um, you know, the lowest vaccinated zip code. So we really wanted to make sure 
that the access was there, but we also needed to facilitate the enrollment to those uh, appointments. And now we're at a point where we're even um, going to be talking about how people can get a vaccine through walk-ins. That is such an interesting point, Dr. Lyman Torres. We're going to talk more about that because we want viewers who haven't gotten a vaccine to get one as soon as possible. We're going to touch on that and we're going to get into the numbers when we come back. You saw the graph. It broke it down by age, but we have other numbers that Dr. Velez de Brown is going to talk about who has already gotten the vaccine, who needs to get the vaccine. Very important information. We'll get to that in a moment. Welcome back to our community conversation on race and equity. Now, we've been talking a lot about 
who needs to get the vaccine and where you can get it. But let's take a look at the numbers. Dr. Velez Day Brown is here to break down what age group is getting the vaccine, what population, what race, and just general information about where this vaccine is going. Yes, so um, early on during the beginning of this pandemic, we knew that our seniors were the, f the ones that were getting the sickest. Um, and even during our peak in December, when we had our highest number of cases, it was still the elders who were uh, contracting COVID-19 at the highest rate. So since instituting the um, community vaccine locations, as you can see on your screens, now we're actually starting to see a lot of vaccine uptake amongst the younger population. And that's really important because as it is now the 18 to 39 year olds who are contributing the highest number of cases in our region. Um, and so we're, we're very pleased to see um, that this population is taking advantage of the vaccine sites that are being set up in uh, their own backyard. But it is so important that all across all age groups, we continue uh, to go get tested, to wear our masks when you're around anyone within six feet of someone who doesn't live in your household, to just keep washing and sanitizing your hands. Um, and so in addition to looking at the ages of folks that are coming through, we've also been able to see a, a pretty widespread of different racial groups that are coming through to the community locations. Um, so it's serving not just the communities of color, but also uh, a significant number of our white Caucasian uh, partners and, and neighbors as well. Unfortunately, the numbers are not so good when we look at the ethnic breakdown. Um, we are still seeing a significantly lower uh, rate of vaccination among the Hispanic community. Um, and so it is our Latino friends and neighbors um, that are not taking advantage of some of these locations that are, are specifically being put in our own neighborhoods, our own backyard. Um, and I do think it's important for everyone to be aware we have all kinds of resources to make this information, um, asking questions linguistically um, available. So there are folks uh, who are from the community who are volunteering and working at these sites. We have language line available. Um, we have uh, just recently over the past weekend had uh, an a vaccination event for our deaf and hard of hearing community members. So we are taking many, many steps to try to make this vaccine and information and um, answering questions available to all different aspects and all different subsets of our community. Dr. Velez de Brown, thank you. On that note about language, by the way, I do want to note that we do plan to have a Spanish translated version of this very town hall over on our website tomorrow, rochesterfirst.com. It's gonna be there indefinitely. So feel free once that's up to share it and hopefully it will infiltrate the Spanish speaking community so they can see all of these wonderful answers. Speaking of wonderful answers, we're gonna request one uh, from Dr. Lyman Torres right now. Let's say folks are watching this and they say, okay, I've heard what I need to hear. I need to get that vaccine. Where do they go? Do they, is there a number? What advice can you give them? Well, what I can say is that there are a variety of places where you can get the vaccine today, whether that be at the Hawkeye site, whether that be at the convention center or our neighborhood based sites. So if you have access to a computer, go to MonroeCounty.gov and find the, the vaccine appointment that works best for you. Uh, all those locations buttons are right there and people don't have to worry. There are vaccine appointments available. We also want you to call. If you don't have access to the internet or don't want to deal with that, we know that many people don't, you can call 753-5555 and someone will assist you with making an appointment or just telling you when you'll be able to walk in. So just know that you can get the vaccine at the locations that we're gonna be able to put up and, and show you the calendar of places where you can go. But we also want you to know that you can still get them at pharmacies. You can get them through your physician. Um, there are many avenues that you can access the vaccine. But if you need to access it closer to your home or you want to, we have been running community-based, neighborhood-based clinics um, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays and Sundays uh, at a variety of times and locations throughout the city of Rochester. So if one wasn't in your neighborhood last week, it may be this week. So it's very important that you take a look at that. Uh, we've been holding them at churches. Uh, we've been holding them at our, our centers, as well as um, some of our community-based organization locations. So we encourage you to go to MonroeCounty.gov 
Check that out. And if you can't do that or would like to call, call 753-5555 and someone will assist you with where to go. Dr. Lyman Torres, thank you. And appointments are available. We're going to take a quick break, but coming up after the break, we're going to talk about some of the health risks and concerns, including side effects and fertility for pregnant women. Welcome back to our community conversation. Now, we've been talking a lot about the vaccine and about the concerns, and one of the concerns is the side effects and the potential health risks that may come with the vaccine. We're going to talk to Dr. Velez Day Brown right now and ask her about some of these side effects, what people should know, and specifically for childbearing women, there's a concern about fertility. Can you tell us anything about that? Yes, absolutely. So, first of all, I just want to normalize the fact that it is always normal to be concerned about side effects for any kind of a new treatment. But thankfully, upwards of 80% of vaccine recipients in all of the studies had no side effects, no immune response whatsoever. Um, and those who did, the side effects were typically mild and they didn't last more than two or three days. Um, the vast majority of people who have received the vaccine have not had to take a day off from work. Um, they've been able to continue uh, and so most people do completely fine with the vaccine. 
if someone is going to have a side effect, well, the most common one, of course, is pain at the injection site in the arm. That's all I personally had when I got my first dose. Um, my arm was pretty sore, but I had full strength. I had full mobility. Um, I didn't even need to take any pain medication for it. It did not cause me to have to miss work. Um, some folks can feel a little bit of extra tiredness or fatigue. Other side effects that or immune responses that people have reported include things like headaches, muscle aches, joint aches, um, some folks can develop GI symptoms like nausea and vomiting, but again, that's the min minority of people across all different racial and ethnic groups who get the vaccine. Um, the likelihood of having a severe side effect is less than 0.5%, so it's actually really quite rare, and that likelihood is still much lower than your chance of getting COVID and all of the symptoms that we know come along with that, the fever, the cough, the soreness, and taking the risk of developing some of, that, some of those long COVID syndromes where people continue to have that fatigue for weeks, sometimes even months after they've recovered. Um, in terms of, uh, I, I understand and respect the fact that there are lots of fears among young reproductive age women um, that this vaccine will interfere with their future fertility. We really have no reason to think that that would be the case. And one very reassuring fact is that the vast majority of us have had at least one vaccine in our lives, and we have lots of years of data that indicate that that has not been the case. Yes, these vaccines are new, but they are based on a lot of information and research and scientific knowledge that we have from old vaccines that are typically used. Um, based also on what we know about how these vaccines work, there's no reason to think that any component of the vaccine is going to hang around in the body very long. So specifically the vaccines that include the mRNA technology, your own body uses mRNA, the messenger RNA, to help your body function all the time. So we already have the processes in our body to kind of break down those messenger RNA molecules and recycle the parts. So there's no component of the vaccine that's gonna hang around in your body for very long. And we also know um, that there are concerns about folks thinking that because this is an RNA vaccine, it's somehow going to interact or interfere with one's own DNA. And that's just not the case. We know that our own bodies protect our genetic material, the material that makes you who you are, inside the nucleus of a cell. And so these RNA instructions that are delivered by the vaccine, they never enter the nucleus of the cell. All of the machinery that's used to make the proteins that teach your body how to fight COVID, that all happens in a completely different part of the cell. So there's never any concern that there's going to be an interaction. I got my vaccine almost a month ago now, my second dose. I haven't developed any mutant superpowers. I can't fly. You know, I'm every, there's no reason to think that these vaccines are going to interfere with the genetic material of a mother or her children. And the platform that is used specifically for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has already been used in an Ebola vaccine in Guinea and in the Democratic Republic of the Congo during their last outbreak in 2020. And we haven't seen any evidence in those areas that there is any impact on women's fertility. Of course, everyone should speak to their own doctor and talk to someone that you already know, that you already trust to get your questions answered. And as we move forward, we are definitely moving towards a model of being able to get more vaccine out to more primary care physicians so that you can talk to someone that you already know. So feel free to call now and, and have some of your questions answered. Um, but there's no reason to think that there's going to be a long-term impact on someone's fertility. Dr. Velez de Brown, thank you. We are nearing the end here. We have about a minute left. So I'm gonna give the final word to Dr. Lyman Torres right now. Dr. Torres, again, you and your team are out in the community working with the folks. You talk about trust being a huge issue. What's your final message to the community watching right now? My final message to the community is come out. Come out to a clinic tomorrow, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, we've got the information there. You can go to your neighborhood um, church, our center, uh, to Ibero-American Action League's office. We are having vaccine available tomorrow, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, and again next week. You don't have to have an appointment. You can walk in. We are taking walk-ins. If you want to have an appointment, call 753-5555 or go to MonroeCounty.gov and you can get an appointment that way as well. But come out and take advantage of the clinic and the vaccine right in your neighborhood. 
Dr. Lyman Torres, Dr. Archie, Dr. Velez Dave Brown. Thank you so much for being here. Also, Dr. Hank Rubin, who joined us earlier on in this broadcast. It was a huge help, very informative. By the way, that Spanish translated version, again, it's going to be at rochesterfirst.com tomorrow. And also, if you missed any of the info from today's conversation or you just want a refresher, don't hesitate to go rochesterfirst.com to follow along.